Um, okay, Bill. All right. Your host again. I'm recording. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Uh, today, we're going to begin a topic that I have promised everybody for a long time. That's biology. And in particular today, we're going to be talking about the theory of evolution. Before I start any of that, I have to make a disclaimer. Uh, I haven't taken biology since the 10th grade. Oh dear. <laughs> so uh, I'm doing my best to uh, check and double check anything I tell you. Um, if at any point you, you think I've said something that's not correct, please don't hesitate to speak up because it might not be. I'm trying the best I can, but I'm, I'm uh, you know, just might get something wrong. The other thing is, uh, when you ask questions, it's probably going to be pretty simple for you to ask a question I will not know the answer to. Okay? That doesn't mean don't ask questions. If I don't know the answer, I'll say, I don't know the answer to that. I will try to find out and tell you next week. So don't, please don't hesitate with any questions you might have. Uh, and, uh, you know, if if you happen to have knowledge on some topic that I'm talking about and feel like I have not mentioned something important, please speak up about that. Uh, but anyway, uh, so, so much for that. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk pretty much about uh, the history of the theory of evolution um, and bring it from the time of Darwin up to pretty much right now, not quite, but close. We're going to talk about uh, all the things that happened after Darwin that contribute to our understanding uh, of how evolution happens. And that's, of course, primarily with DNA. Uh, next week, we're going to have a lesson in which we will dive headfirst into DNA We'll discuss the chemical structure of DNA, and we'll see how that provides an explanation for a lot of things that we encounter in evolution. But I want to emphasize, and this is one of, well, the other point I'm going to really lean on next week, is DNA explains a lot. It does not explain everything. Uh, there, I, one of the things I'm going to try to do as we go along is uh, correct what I see are some common misconceptions about evolution. Uh, and one of them is after we, we see how DNA works, uh, there, there's this idea that we are our genes, that, you know, you get born with a set of genes and bingo, that there's your life. You know, you just do what those genes tell you to do. That's not the case at all. Uh, and we're going to discuss other factors besides genes, uh, which play a lot in, in our lives. Uh, genes are very important, but many other things are as well. Okay, so that's where we're going. So let's get started with today's lesson. Uh, the first thing we want to, and this may be a misconception, it used to be for me, uh, it was like, you know, Darwin invented the idea. No, the idea of evolution had been around for quite a while. In fact, Darwin's own grandfather had written a book about evolution. So what that idea was that living things can change their form, that those things are not fixed. And the reason it had been around is that people were already finding fossil evidence that showed that. They were finding fossils that they could recognize uh, as relating to life that existed, but it was different. It wasn't quite the same. 
And so that sort of gave people the idea that, that life changes over time. Uh, what Darwin did was to provide a mechanism that explains why this would happen. So a little bit about his life. Uh, he went to Cambridge University, but he kind of avoided uh, the really tough stuff there. Uh, he was more, he, he was from a not rich, but certainly well-off family. Uh, and it had, you know, they had been comfortable economically for a long time. Uh, and he was kind of settled into this, okay, I'm a well-off guy and, you know, I, I need to go to college and learn some stuff, but certainly don't need to break my neck at this. Uh, just want to get a nice degree and then go on with life. Uh, it happened that uh, he had a cousin who attended uh, uh, Cambridge at exactly the same time he did. And his cousin had taken up a very popular hobby then, which was collecting and identifying beetles. Now, for some reason, that was a real fad at the time. People would love to go out in the country and, and collect beetles and bring them back and try to determine if there was some beetle that was well known or if they had found something that nobody knew about. Uh, and so Darwin got into that. Uh, and that really did get him interested uh, in natural science somewhat. So he started taking uh, botany courses uh, and he thought those were pretty good. So when he graduated from Cambridge, he sort of had a problem. Uh, he had to figure out, you know, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Uh, his father was an Anglican minister, uh, and he wanted Charles to also become an Anglican minister. Uh, Darwin wasn't really against that idea, but he wasn't really big on it either. It was something he could do, yeah, but maybe maybe something else was what he wanted. So while he was sort of, sort of sitting around trying to figure out what to do, uh, another opportunity came along. Uh, the British Navy was going to send a little ship called the Beagle on a two-year expedition to map the coastline of South America. Now, because it was a small ship, uh, the only officers were the, the captain, a fellow named Robert Fitzroy, and some very junior officers. And the captain realized two years is a long time, and these junior officers, these are you know, these boys right out of the teens, you know, they're officers, but they really don't know a lot. I'd really like to have somebody around that I could have decent conversation with while we're spending all this time going along mapping this coastline. So he came up with an idea. He said it'd be really nice if we had a naturalist on our expedition. So he advertised for one and someone who knew Darwin said, hey, here's a chance you can go do this. Well, Darwin thought that seemed pretty like an interesting idea uh, to go sail around South America for a couple of years. But he did a very shrewd thing here. Uh, before he agreed to do it, he said, I'll, I will do this, but here's a condition I have. Any kind of uh, natural object that I collect, any kind of writing I do is going to be my property. It will not belong to the Navy. Well, this was not really an official position on the ship. It wasn't like he was becoming an officer. And so the captain worked a bargain with Darwin's father. He said, if you'll pay all his costs, cover his food and supplies and so on, so it doesn't cost the Navy anything, I'll agree to that condition. And so it got worked out. Well, it turned out this expedition didn't take two years. It took five. Um, but it gave Darwin the opportunity to observe a lot of different types of flora and fauna. Uh, in particular, when they were, uh, when they had sailed around from the Atlantic side, they were going up the Pacific Ocean along the coast of Chile. Uh, Chile is a, if you've ever been there, you know this, uh, if you look at the map, you'll notice it's a very long country. And so it was going to take a long time to map that coastline. So Darwin decided he would get off the ship uh, and do some overland traveling 
and then catch the ship at some other port later on. And so uh, he traveled for several weeks overland and he collected a, a lot of biological specimens. Then he rejoined the ship and they continued going north in the, in the Pacific and came to the Galapagos Islands. And when they got to those islands, uh, Darwin noticed that there were a lot of animals on, the, on those islands that were quite similar to those that he had seen in Chile, but just slightly different. Uh, the other thing he noticed uh, is that on the different islands, there were a lot of animals that they had the same animal on one island as another, but they again, they would vary somewhat by island. The Galapagos Islands, it's like Hawaii, it's a volcanic island chain. Uh, it sits on a hot spot in the Pacific, uh, and as the tectonic plates move, then new islands get created. Uh, and older ones, the volcanic activity ends and uh, they change environmentally. So there's a lot of differences in those islands. Some of them are just above sea level, uh, and these can be very dry and not have a lot of vegetation. Others are pretty high. There's a couple with mountains that are almost a mile high, and they have a very varied climate, and they have a lot of rainforest areas. So there are two types of animals that Darwin noticed particularly. Uh, one was the birds that he called finches. Now, it turns out they're actually uh, a type of tanager, but that really doesn't matter. Uh, they, 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 they're called finches to this day, even though they're not really finches. The other thing he noticed was the tortoises, and uh, there are huge tortoises on the Galapagos Islands. And all these things differed uh, just a little bit from as, when you went from island to island. When Darwin finally got back to England, uh, he gave his collection to the Zoological Society of London. And they had an ornithologist study the birds. And the ornithologist concluded that he had found 12 different species of birds. So that was very interesting to Darwin, that, that there were so many different species. And uh, he, he has some sketches here of some of the, the, the pictures he saw. And you can see the differences here in the beaks. There are some of them that have these very large beaks. And then there are others that have smaller beaks. And then the, this particular one, number uh, four here, has a, has a very, very narrow beak. Uh, when he checked back on the locations where he had acquired each of the specimens, he realized that he could correlate those differences in the beak size and shape to the environment in which he had found those birds, and also to the diet of, of the birds. Those birds, those finches with the big beaks, tend to live mostly off nuts and seeds. And they would use those beaks to crunch those things up. And the finches that had the short beaks, a lot of them lived around prickly pear cactus. And they would use that short beak to punch holes in the cactus uh, and eat the pulp from inside the cactus. So based on these observations uh, and some others that he had made, he developed uh, his theory of, of evolution uh, by natural selection. He decided, for example, that all his finches had shared a common ancestor for the South American mainland. But after they arrived on the islands, then they evolved into different species depending on what kind of food was available for them. And that's how they got all those different beaks. Now, uh, Darwin had his background, his father was a minister, and he knew that evolution was, was going to cause, cause controversy. He knew that a lot of religious people would just not want to accept it. And so, even though he had come to believe in it firmly, 
uh, he didn't publish anything about it. He, he had published a popular journal uh, about his trip, just sort of describing the things he had seen. But uh, he didn't really publish anything about his conclusions about evolution. Uh, what he did do was talk to some of his friends in the scientific community about it, and they agreed with him uh, that, yeah, yeah, we think you've got a good idea there. Then, June of 1858, one day in the mail, he gets a paper from another naturalist, a fellow named Alfred Russell Wallace, who had been on his own borders. Uh, he had been basically in the area of Indonesia for several years. He had seen a lot of stuff that gave him the same idea as Darwin had. He said, I'm seeing a lot of species on this island, and when I go to the next island, there's something like it, but a little bit different. And so he independently had developed this idea of evolution by natural selection. So this presented a major problem for Darwin. Here he had done all this work, uh, come up with his theory, and you know he hadn't published it. Now somebody else had actually written up a paper. So here's what Darwin did. He quickly wrote up his own paper about his ideas. Uh, and then because he didn't want to not give credit to Wallace, he arranged that both of their papers would be presented to the Royal Society on the same day. Now, as it turns out, uh, even though he tried to make sure that Wallace got proper credit, uh, and if you talk to any evolutionary biologist, they will tell you as much about Wallace as they will about Darwin. But if you stop the average guy on the street and say, uh, what do you think of when you think about evolution? They're always going to say Darwin, of course. Uh, so Darwin did get the, the, the press. Uh, there's uh, some indication that he was a better writer than Wallace was. But they were both excellent biologists. And in their later lives, they worked together. Uh, they would uh, send each other their, their ideas. So it wasn't like they became enemies or anything about this. Now, neither one of them, though, uh, suggested any kind of, of mechanism about, you know, how we, okay, evolution happens by natural selection, but, but, but what actually makes things change? What's going on uh, that they actually change? Well, it turns out that at about the same time, another scientist was doing work that would help to explain that. Uh, and that's uh, an Austrian uh, biologist named Gregor Mendel. Uh, in 1865, he published his, his work on inheritance. Now, Mendel had uh, come from a not well-off family uh, and he'd been able to get a secondary education, but his family couldn't afford to send him to the university. And so he came up with a plan where he'd get a university education. Uh, he joined the Augustinian Order, which is one of the teaching orders of the Catholic Church. And he knew that since uh, they would want him to be a teacher, that they would send him to the university, and they did. So he did get his university education, uh, and then he took a position at an abbey. Uh, and while he was in uh, in college, he got very interested in biology. So when he uh, joined this abbey, he asked the abbot, "Could he plant a garden?" And you know that seems like a, you know abbeys always have gardens. So sure, you can plant your garden. So what he did uh, in his garden among other things, is in a, in a greenhouse, he grew pea plants. And he very carefully hand pollinated them. He would take pollen from one type of plant uh, and use it to pollinate a different type of pea plant. Now, at that time, it was the common belief that if you did that, then you would get a kind of pea that would be a mixture of the, the peas that you had pollinated. In other words, like if you took peas of two different colors, you would get some third color uh, as the outcome. 
Well, when he actually did it, it turned out that's not what happened at all. He crossbred yellow peas uh, with green peas. And the peas that developed from that first generation all came out yellow. There were no green ones at all. Well, then what he did was he, he took these yellow peas from this generation uh, and he cross-pollinated them with themselves. And he went, he, when he did that, he got a second generation and that had 75% of the peas as yellow and 25% of the peas as green. So he developed this theory of inheritance. He said uh, that each UP plant must inherit a color trait from each of its parents. And it must be true that one of those color traits is the dominant one. And the other is what we call now call the recessive one. So if we say that the yellow trait is a Y and the green trait is a G, then the first generation would have YG for their color traits. But because yellow is dominant, if you have a Y at all, you're going to be yellow. But now when you crossbreed those plants with each other, the new plants can get a Y from one parent and either a Y or a G from the other. And so you got to get these combinations. You could get a plant that was a YY, you could get a plant that was a YG, you could get a GY, which is basically the same thing, or you could get a GG. Now, three of those have the yellow color uh, trait, and one does not. So that's why 75% came out as yellow, and 25% came out as green. Uh, then he tried a separate experiment. He took one type of pea that had smooth and round seeds, uh, and he cross-pollinated that with a second type of pea that had wrinkled seeds. Uh, and now in his first generation, uh, they all came out having smooth seeds, which means that the smooth seeds are the dominant ones. And then when you crossbreed them, you get exactly the same result in the second generation. You get 75% smooth uh, and 25% uh, wrinkled. And he said, well, okay, uh, what happens if I crossbreed both traits at the same time? So he found uh, yellow peas that had wrinkled seeds, and he found green peas that had round seeds and he cross-pollinated those. Well, his first generation from that produced yellow peas with round seeds. And that's what he expected because he'd already established that yellow and round are the dominant traits. And so they're gonna persist in that first generation. But uh, if you look at, at all the possibilities, you can have uh, yellow and brown. You can have yellow and wrinkled. Uh, you can have uh, green and brown. You can have uh, green and wrinkled. And so when you crossbreed those, uh, you get a total of 16 possibilities, depending on how the traits sort themselves out. Uh, you could have. Uh, in that second generation, they could inherit two yellow color, color traits and two wrinkled traits. So they could get a yellow color trait, wrinkled trait, yellow color, color trait, and a round trait. And you can, you can go through and figure out those are all the combinations you can get uh, if you take uh, the Ys and the Gs and the Ws and the Rs. You count those up, there are a total of 16. And then if you go through remembering that yellow is dominant and round is dominant. So whenever 
you have a yellow trait, you're going to get a yellow P. Whenever you have a round trait, you'll get a round P. So if you add everything up, what you turn what it turns out you get is you get nine yellow and brown C's, three yellow and wrinkle C's, three green and round C's, and one green and wrinkle C. Well, now, if you look at uh, the percentages, uh, you'll see that your 75-25 is still, is still there because if you look at all the yellow ones, Nine of them are round, three are wrinkled. So 25% wrinkled and 75% round. And uh, if you look at the piece that came out green, you have three green round ones and one green and wrinkled one. So there's a total of four of them green, 25% are wrinkled and 75% uh, are round. If you do the analysis by color, it will come out exactly the same way. So what he's done is he's established what we now call the laws of inheritance. Now, his abbey was in a small provincial town in Austria. And so when he wrote up his results, he sent them to the local science journal. Well, unfortunately, uh, because it's just a little town in, in Austria, hardly anyone read that journal. And so during his lifetime, he never got any credit for this discovery. Uh, he died in 1881, and about 1900, a couple of other groups of scientists basically rediscovered his results. They basically redid his experiment, and they both came up with the same results he did. One of those two groups did a really deep literary search and they found his paper. So finally, at this time, uh, he got credit as being the originator of the idea. Now, there's some other things that 18th century biologists did that are important to note. Uh, they discovered some other uh, constituents of, uh, of, of cells that turn out to be very, very important when we're trying to understand how evolution works. Uh, the first amino acid was found in 1810. Uh, and throughout the 19th century, more and more amino acids kept being found. Uh, it turns out there are lots of amino acids uh, there are 20 of them that occur uh, in, in us, in humans. Uh, and that's an important number. So we'll, we'll keep coming back to that later on. Uh, that of all the possible amino acids, that our bodies make use of 20 of them. Uh, another thing that was uh, discovered uh, in 1838 uh, was the cell constituent that we call proteins. Uh, it, took, it would take a hundred years, uh, but finally it got established that what proteins are, when they were found, they were just thought, they were just looked at as these huge chemical compounds that, that contain lots and lots of atoms uh, of, of different types. But when we finally got into the 20th century, people recognize that what they are is their amino acids that are chained together. So proteins are essentially uh, complex combinations of amino acids. Uh, then uh, in 1869, a Swiss biologist discovered uh, the compound that we call deoxyribonucleic acid, more properly now known as DNA. Uh, at the time, uh, he actually also uh, found uh, RNA, ribonucleic acid, but it wasn't recognized. It's uh, for the, from the, the test they do at that time, they couldn't differentiate it from DNA. But by 1890, it was recognized that RNA is a different compound uh, than DNA is. 
Also in about 1880, uh, there was a big advance in the capability of microscopes. And so people were able to start studying cells in much greater detail. Uh, and they were able to pick out uh, these thread-like structures within cells, which they call chromosomes. And by using their microscopes, they established that chromosomes came in pairs. Uh, and then they were actually able to study uh, the how single cells split uh, by cell division uh, to produce two new cells. And they saw when that happened that each pair of chromosomes in the cell split at the same time and that one of the pair went with the new cell and the other stayed in the original cell. And then both single chromosomes then produced, well, there was then produced a matching chromosome so that in the new cell and the old cell, there would again be a pair of chromosomes. And then the other thing that uh, they observed uh, w with their more powerful microscopes is they, they were able to actually witness that what we're talking about with cell division uh, is the simple kind of, of reproduction where cells just split. Uh, we know in a lot of animals and plants, we have the more complicated process of sexual reproduction in which their sperm cells merge with egg cells. And when they looked at what happened with the chromosomes there, they saw that when the sperm and egg cells uh, merged to produce uh, a new cell, that the chromosomes again were split and repaired in such a way that in the, in the new cell, each one would have one chromosome that came from the sperm cell and one that came from the egg cell. Uh, so what they, in, they, they call the uh, chromosomes, the, the, the one that comes from the female is called the X chromosome. The one that uh, comes from the male is called the Y chromosome. Uh, what they saw was that all females have two X chromosomes, uh, but the males have an X and a Y chromosome. So males have a different chromosome that, that females don't have. And what that has to mean is this, that since a male has an X and a Y chromosome, uh, then he has to get his Y chromosome from his father because his mother doesn't have one to pass along. But since he gets one chromosome from each, then his X chromosome has to come from his mother. Now, a female has two X chromosomes, and she has to get one from her mother and one from her father. Okay. Now, that observation is very important for what happened next. Uh, in 1907, an American biologist named <coughs> Thomas Hunt Morgan started studying heredity and fruit flies. And he was hoping to learn how mutations occur. By this time, it was recognized that mutation had something to do with evolution, but nobody understood how mutations would happen. So he was hoping to find that out. And he picked fruit flies to work with because you can get lots and lots of fruit flies really easily. Uh, and they breed, you know, almost continuously. So you could easily get lots and lots of generations of fruit flies to study. Now, even though he started in 1907, it was 1910 before he managed to get anywhere. Uh, all the fruit flies that he began to work with had red eyes. And then just one day in 1910, looking at his fruit, fruit flies, he spotted a male fruit fly that had white eyes. Well, since every fruit fly up to then it had red eyes, 
He knew this has to be a mutation. So he said, okay, what's going to happen with this uh, mutation? And, uh, and at the time, it, since it's 1910, uh, people in general know about uh, Mendel's work, uh, but not everybody except that, in fact, Morgan himself wasn't really sure if Mendel was right or not. But he's going to now have the opportunity to show that it is indeed true. So what he does is he takes his male fruit fly with the white eyes and he puts him in a cage with only females. And of course, they all have red eyes because all the other fruit flies they had had red eyes. So a generation of offspring gets produced, and they all have red eyes. Well, obviously, red eyes is going to be dominant because every fruit fly up, up to then had had red eyes. And so this agrees with what Mendel had said, that when you, when you crossbreed them the first time, everybody's going to have red eyes because that's dominant. So what he then did is take the fruit flies that had been produced by this first mating uh, and he crossbred those. And here's what he got. He got 75% red-eyed flies and 25% white-eyed flies. Well, that's just what Mendel had said, that the, the uh, red eyes is dominant, but the white eyes will get white eyed trait will get passed along and in that second generation it'll you show up with 25 percent of that so that was exactly what Mendel said but there was one other strange factor here and that is that that 25 percent of fruit flies with white eyes were all male okay well that you know that can't be coincidence got to be something going on there. Uh, and uh, so Morgan said, well, let's crossbreed one more time and see what happens. And so he, he again crossbred uh, the white-eyed males that he had now with the, uh, and all, remember, all his females are still have red eyes with the red-eyed females. This time he produced a generation that had equal numbers of red-eyed males and females and equal numbers of white-eyed males and females. So how does he interpret his results? Well, he said, well, the only possible, possible way to explain this is this. We already know about X chromosomes and Y chromosomes. It must be that the color trait is carried on one of those sex chromosomes, either the X or the Y. Uh, but it can't be the Y chromosome because uh, if it had been, then his first generation offspring, male flies, would have had white eyes and not red because their father uh, would have had a, uh, a white uh, I, uh, trait on his Y chromosome. So he says, okay, it's got to be that it's the X chromosome that's carrying this I color trait. Uh, and then he said, well, does that make sense? And he says, okay, yes, it does. Uh, because uh, if we, when we first crossbred the white eyed male, with the red-eyed female, then the eye color traits on the X chromosome, uh, and so it's going to be red on everybody. The, the, that one male has, uh, it's gonna be red on everybody except for the, the one male, uh, but the all the descendants are going to get an X chromosome from the females, and those are all red. And so whether they uh, get a white X chromosome from that male or not doesn't matter because red's dominant. Uh, so what you have in, the, in that second generation 
uh, is you have a bunch of, of fruit flies, some male, some female. The males have uh, an X chromosome that they got from their mothers, and so it's going to be red. The females get one X chromosome from the mothers, one from the fathers, so some of them are, uh, half of them are going to get that white uh, eye color chromosome. And uh, so when we crossbreed again, we finally have the opportunity for the, to get uh, offspring that have a white chromosome, uh, a YX chromosome from the male and from the female. So we finally get fruit flies with, uh, with white eyes, but they're all male because the, uh, the, the females uh, <coughs> can't get it. Okay, so here's our explanation. All the females still have red eyes because the X chromosome they, they get from their mothers is red. Uh, they get from their, from their fathers is red, but the X chromosome they get from their mothers can be red or white. Uh, so half of the females will have X chromosome red, uh, and the other will, will have one that, that's, will have both of them red, and the other half will have one that's red and one that's white. Uh, and now when you breed these with white-eyed males, those males have the X chromosome white. Uh, and so now you get uh, them uh, getting their X chromosomes from the, their mothers so that 75% of them uh, will get the red-eyed X chromosome from their mothers but 25% will get the white X chromosome. Since their own X chromosome is white, then they're going to have white eyes. Uh, so that's how we get the, the, the final outcome uh, coming out as it is. Okay, so Morgan's able to put all that stuff together uh, and he's able to explain uh, everything in terms of using Mendel's laws and the additional fact of the X and Y, that it's the X chromosome that's carrying the eye color trait. So he and his students decide, do some more investigation, and, and they say, well, you know, these chromosomes, there must be something physical inside each chromosome where these traits are stored. Uh, and so they began calling the component of the chromosome that stores traits a gene. Now that term had actually been used before, but they were the first ones to use it in, in the modern sense. Uh, then in, in 1915, Morgan and three of the students published a, a book that they called The Mechanism of Mendelian Heredity. And that was the standard reference for evolutionary biologists for a long, long time. In 1933, Morgan received the Nobel Prize for his work on heredity. Now, you might notice he had three students. And you might ask, well, why didn't they share in the prize? Well, you, you hit your old Nobel Prize rules again here. It can only be split up three ways. So it couldn't be split between him and his three students because that's four ways. Well, Morgan was a great guy. And so he said, well, okay, they won't give you guys the prize, but, and, and, and therefore you don't get the medal. And, but he says, you can get the money. Uh, so he took the money monetary award that he got and he split it four ways and gave parts to each of his three students. Uh, so they have figured out now that there's something in the chromosome that's responsible for heredity. And the question is, what is it? And they weren't able to answer that question. Uh, 
but most of biologists in that time were thinking it was some protein in the, in, in the chromosome. Uh, but then uh, an American biologist uh, named Oswald Avery uh, did a, an experiment that convinced him uh, that it was in fact uh, the, the genes that are that are responsible, the, the DNA that's responsible. Uh, but he was on the when he did that experiment, he was getting ready to re to retire. It's the last experiment he ever did, and since most people thought that it was a, it was a protein, he just did not want to deal with a lot of controversy at this time in his life. And so what he did is he published an, an account of the experiment, telling what he had found, but he didn't publish his conclusion that said it's, it's the DNA that's doing this. So what happened was it, finally in 1952, some other American biologists did a different experiment uh, and they established the same result that it's the DNA that's responsible for, for, for heredity. Uh, and so once that's done, uh, then that started this major research project going by a lot of different biologists uh, in trying to figure out uh, what's the chemical structure of DNA? Uh, what is it about DNA that makes heredity work? So in May of 1952, in, uh, English chemist named Rosalind Franklin, who had gotten in, she had spent a few years in France and she had learned some x ray diffraction techniques there. And so she produced an x ray image of DNA. And this is this image here. And if you look carefully at that, it sort of gives you an idea of what's coming because you see these sort of crossing patterns here. Uh, and, and, uh, that gives a hint as to what's going to happen. A, a little bit after she had produced her image, she went on vacation. Uh, and a couple of biologists from the Cambridge uh, Cavendish Laboratory came down to London to her laboratory and visited another fellow who worked there with her, a guy named Ma Maurice Wilkins. Uh, and they were trying to determine the structure of DNA. And Wilkins said, hey, you know, Rosalind took this uh, x-ray image of uh, DNA and he showed it to them. Well, after they left, they, they went down and caught the train going back to Cambridge. And they started talking about that image. Uh, and that image made them realize that the assumption that they were working on trying to figure out the structure of DNA had to be wrong. So when they got back to Cambridge, uh, they did some thinking and they came up with a new assumption. And with that assumption, they produced this famous double helix model of DNA. Uh, this is Watson, that's Crick. Uh, and I didn't ever notice this before, but looking at this image, I realized something. Uh, the thing that Crick is using to point at the structure is a slide rule. I'm pretty sure that's a slide rule. I used to have one, so I think that's what he's using here. So that kind of interests me. But anyway, here's this complicated uh, double heated structure for DNA that they discovered. And next week, we're going to go into that in great detail. But we just want to finish our story of what happened here. Uh, once they came up with their model, they wrote a paper uh, describing it. And in the paper, they did give proper credit. They said uh, the image uh, provided by Ross and Franklin was, was a great help to us in finding this model. They didn't mention that she didn't show up the image, but someone else did. Uh, the other thing that happened, and, and this is one of the the great injustices in the history of science is that Watson later wrote a popular book talking about his discovery. And when, if you read his book, uh, 
he makes it he makes it sound like Rodson Franklin was an X-ray technician. And, you know, she went. Somebody told her to go take an X-ray, and she did. Uh, and of course, that wasn't true at all. Uh, she was as capable a scientist as they were, uh, and she might have found the result herself given time. But because they got that little jump start while she was on vacation, they came up with it first. And the truly unfortunate thing that happened uh, is that a couple of years after their discovery, uh, she died of cancer. Uh, and so when the Nobel Prize was awarded, once again, we have our Nobel Prize rules that in order to win the prize, you got to be alive. Uh, and she'd already passed away. And so the, the prize was just awarded to Watson and Frick. Uh, and she didn't get to share it. Now, we don't know if she'd been alive, if she would, in fact, have. You know, because the Nobel Prize Committee has been known before to make some pretty egregious errors in presenting the prize. But in this case, there, there was no way she could have received it because she had passed away already. Okay. So that's the, the end of today's lecture. So I am going to unmute everyone. And if you have questions, uh, let's go ahead. Um, Bill, I just had a suggestion for a book. Yeah. Jackie Rich. Um, it's called She Has Her Mother's Laugh by Carl Zimmer, and it's the history of genetics. And he also goes into fascinating case studies of people in asylums who had genetic problems, and of course at that time weren't diagnosed as being genetic. Um, it's very readable. Okay. She has her mother's laugh? She has her mother's laugh. I'll write it in the, the message here. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Science is so fascinating. It is indeed. And, and we have plenty of time to study it. <laughs> yeah. yeah we, we also have that, and, that, and that's nice. Uh, Other questions, other comments? No, enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. All right, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Bill, Bill. Yes. Hi, Paula. Uh, I've been, been getting a lot of background ringing throughout your. Yeah, um... yeah unfortunately, that's my computer. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well then, thanks for explaining <laughs> that. Yeah. Uh, I, every now and then, it's uh, the, the hard drive starts making excess noise. Okay. Does okay. That. Well, have a good um, afternoon. Bye. All right. So, what we're going to do next week, we said we're we're going to examine this uh, this DNA structure, and we're going to see. Uh, what parts of it have to do with heredity. Uh, and, and just as important, we're gonna see that there are also some, some things that contribute to heredity that don't have anything to do with DNA at all. It's very important, but it's not the only thing. Uh, now, uh, that will be our, our last lecture directly on DNA and evolution. And then we're gonna go more into, in, into biology, but it'll this topic will keep coming back up because when we go when we look at uh, we're, we're going to look a lot at the function of the brain, uh, how it does what it does, and the explanation for a lot of that is going to be evolution, okay. and, and we'll try to, to 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 pinpoint specifically what kind of ev evolutionary property is responsible for certain structures in the brain and the way they function. Okay, so everybody have a good week, and I'll see you next week. All right, thank, thank you, you, Bill. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye, y'all.
Thank you. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, well, it is. That certainly is true. But, 